The Girl Who Fell Dingley Cliffs on the western edge of the Maltese Islands are usually a relaxing place to go for a walk while taking in the panoramic sea view. But on the night of March 18th, 2014, this place became the scene of despair and tragedy. That night, two people plunged over the cliff edge onto the unwelcoming rocks below. These were Erin Tanti, aged 23, and Lisa Maria Zara, just 15 years old. Erin was Lisa's drama teacher. Erin was a drama teacher at St. Michael's Foundation School, and he also knew Lisa from the Masquerade Theatre Art School, where he had taught her previously. Lisa was known as a clever student with a keen interest in drama, although at the time she was going through a difficult period and suffering from depression. Just to give you an idea of her family life, she lost her mother at the young age of two and lived with her father and brother. It was known that she engaged in self-harm as a teenager. In fact, self-harm photos can be found on her Tumblr blog. Some reports state that she was overcoming this dark part of her life and looked forward to attending drama school in London after finishing her sixth form studies. Erin and Lisa started a romantic and sexual relationship. Why? How? These are questions only Erin can answer. I think it's fair to say that Lisa was a vulnerable person and it's not a stretch to think that she found a kindred spirit in her drama teacher. He took advantage of her, of the power imbalance between them, of the age gap. He enjoyed the attention she gave him and encouraged it. Lisa and Erin would secretly meet up at Erin's apartment in Valletta. And when her father was abroad on business, they would meet at her family home in Nashar, leading up to the event. Lisa's father was abroad when the family's handyman noticed Erin's car within the estate and called Lisa's brother Nicholas. Together, they watched the security tapes, which showed that Erin came over and stayed overnight in Lisa's room, both nights, the 16th and 17th of March 2014. Alarmed about this, they telephoned Lisa's father to inform him of the situation. He decided to return home on the next flight and asked that Lisa not be left alone, that she should stay over at her brother's house and that her mobile phone should be confiscated. Lisa was upset and angry that her family had found out about the last two nights and outright refused to go to her brother's house. Instead, the mother of her father's partner, Lucy, was to stay in the home and keep an eye on Lisa and the teenager's mobile phone was returned. When she had a moment alone in her room, Lisa immediately called Erin and told him that her family knew everything. They also knew who Erin was because they looked up his car's number plate. Erin was terrified. Did they know that he was her teacher? Had they called the police? He asked her these questions. All she could say was that she was going crazy. Erin texted her saying that if her family truly knew who he was, he was going to kill himself. Lisa replied that she would have nothing to live for and they should end their lives together. At this point, you could see the story as a pair of doomed lovers cursed by circumstance with nowhere to turn. But Erin was an adult vocalizing suicide to a child who had already played with self-harm, a child he had sexually violated when she was too young to consent. Erin was backed into a corner. He was caught on security tape spending the night with an underage girl, his student. He was afraid of what her father would do. Her father is well known in the local community and a powerful man. He was going to lose his job, lose any prospect of working and become known as a pedophile. During the court case, the prosecution suggested that Erin's plan was to kill Lisa, putting a stop to the story, and then he would escape. They suggested that he let her think they were going to commit suicide together, but that he wouldn't really go through with it. In his car, There were three packets of aspirin containing 96 pills total, a bottle of whiskey, and also two 
5,500 euros in cash, together with a number of checks and his passport. At 11.30 p.m. on the night of the 18th of March, Erin picked up Lisa and they drove to Dingley Cliffs. They spent some time drinking whiskey and taking pills. Together, they left the vehicle and stumbled towards the cliff edge. On that dark night, Lisa tumbled to her death on the cruel rocks below. She fell approximately 32 meters, that is, 13 floors, and died with several injuries, including a fractured cranium, multiple broken bones, and hemorrhage. The next day, around midday, passers-by noticed a figure on the cliffs. The figure motioned for help, and ambulances rushed over. Emergency personnel found two persons. Erin was alive, and around 50 meters away from him, Lisa was found to be dead. By helicopter, Erin and Lisa's body were airlifted to hospital. Erin claims he jumped a few seconds after Lisa, but medical personnel found that his injuries were far less serious than those Lisa had suffered. Erin was released from hospital after a few days of observation. On March 26, he was released by the police, but kept under constant police surveillance. On March 28, Lisa's funeral was held. The next year, on June 25, Erin was granted bail. From this point, Erin lived and worked in the community. I remember seeing him around my village. On April 10, 2018, his trial went ahead. The court case. Erin was accused of voluntary homicide, aiding a person in suicide, defiling a person in his care as a teacher, participating in sexual acts with a vulnerable person, child pornography, and abusing his position. After her death, Lisa's iPhone was investigated. Officers found nude photos of the teenager, where, reflected in a mirror, was the image of the person taking the photos. That person was Erin. In 2019, Erin Tanti pleaded guilty to all charges and was handed a 20-year prison sentence. Winston Zara, the victim's cousin, said on behalf of his family, We have always known as a family that this was a case of murder, and finally, after a long drawn-out five years, Erin Tanti has admitted in court to the crime of murdering Lisa Maria. In the spirit of full transparency, I want to clearly state that I knew Erin Tanti a long time ago. I remember him from my university days, when we had a few classes together. That's why, throughout my discussion, I refer to him as Erin, because that's how I knew him. At the time, I thought of him as a theatre nerd, a rather goofy person with niche interests that wasn't in any way popular, but he had his little group of like-minded drama people. I would like to leave you with a few questions about this case. Did the school conduct an inquiry into how one of their teachers was able to commit these crimes against a student? Did Lisa's friends notice anything strange about her behaviour when she was around Erin? Did she seem to be in better spirits the last few months of her life? And was she getting the help that she needed with her mental health and self-harming? That's it for this case. Join me next time when I delve into the brutal murder of an eight-year-old child which took place in Malta in the 1960s.